All right, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, today I'd like to welcome Dr. Doug Powell, who's an illustrious member of our faculty that many of you know well. But for those of you that don't, a little bit of background. Um, after attending medical school at the University of Michigan, he completed his residency and his internship here at the University of Washington. Served as chief medical resident at Harborview Medical Center and now has been serving as faculty at UW for nearly 30 years, has held many titles in the past, but currently holds multiple titles, including professor in the Department of Medicine, director of medical student programs, and endowed chair for patient-centered clinical education, just to name a few. He has had numerous publications on a wide variety of topics, uh, over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, over 50 book chapters, and some of uh, his most recent topics of interest included dispelling medical myths, which we're going to hear about more today, uh, drug interactions in polypharmacy, and evaluation and management of common symptoms and diseases in the ambulatory setting. Uh, he serves as a journal reviewer uh, for quite a few journals, but um, including the American Journal of Medicine and JGIM, just to name a few. Nationally, uh, serves on a number of committees, serves on the AOA Board of Directors, is the course director for many national conferences, including for the ACP and the CDIM. Serves on a number of committees and task forces on the national level, and uh, too numerous for me to list them all. Um, but above all, I think that he's known well for his teaching, for which clearly he has both a passion and a talent. Um, he serves as the Department of Medicine coordinator for ambulatory and inpatient medicine clerkships. He's been the recipient of uh, a number of honors and awards, both for his teaching and for his master clinicianship. Um, indeed, he's been elected to the ACP mastership. He has been the recipient of the ACP Chapter Centennial Legacy Award. He has, over the years, been the recipient of the Turk Award, the Beeson Award, the Robert Evans Award, and many, many more. Elected to the Gold Humanism Honor Society this year, and the recipient of quite a few distinguished teaching awards, both from re recognized by medical students, faculty, and residents. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pao, um, who will be speaking about medical myths when dogma is for the dogs. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you folks about this. I, I, I think it was 10 or 15 years ago that I covered this topic here at Ground Rounds before, and I've tried to update myths. And uh, what we'll do is talk about the evolution of these. Some of the things that were near and dear to my heart as myths 20 years ago, many people in this audience haven't even heard of because we actually do make progress over time. So we'll go through some old, old myths for the old timers of us at the end if we have time. So what we're going to do is break this up into kind of what I call the next generation, which are some of the newer myths that, uh, that have been fun to look into. I couldn't help but cover a few of my all-time favorites, and then uh, we'll cover at the end a few retired myths. Uh, and uh, just we have audience participation with audience response, so please do weigh in uh, with your thoughts on that. Why do myths occur? I, I've tried to divide things into three different areas, and I'll comment as we go through the myths on which, which of these I think led to them. Um, when physiology makes incredible sense, so it's just we learn physiology, it makes so much sense, of course it's going to happen that way. It turns out to be a myth when it doesn't happen that way in humans. When, or there might be another way that it happens in the bulk of physiology we get, but there may be some other approach that we haven't thought about. So when you look at what happens to certain things in humans, it doesn't always work out the way we're always taught. Case reports. Case reports are probably the number one cause for myths. Somebody sees something bad happen, they report it, and they have an assumption that they have an idea of why it is. Very different than when you look at large numbers of people and study it. So many myths come out of a case report, one or two case reports. And then the last one that I couldn't really put my finger on is tradition. It's just, it is because it is. And you go back and back in time and you find no reason other than somebody who was well respected said, this is the way it is, sort of the word of God deal. So that's kind of where I think myths come from. And, and I'll try to comment on each one of these, wh which of these I think it was. So here's our first one. A 32-year-old man develops diarrhea after receiving amoxicillin clavulinate to treat an infection following a dog bite. 
He is diagnosed with Clostridia difficile and prescribed a 10-day course of metronidazole. He has no other medical problems. He will be the best man at his brother's wedding tomorrow. What advice should you give him about alcohol use at the reception? Do not take metronidazole the day of the wedding if you will be drinking alcohol. Take metronidazole, do not drink alcohol, or it's okay to drink alcohol. So let's have you weigh in and see what you think. So, 63% say take the metronidazole, don't drink alcohol. 4% say just skip the metronidazole on the day of the uh, wedding. And 33% say go to the wedding, have a good time, don't worry about it. And I think probably C is probably the most reasonable answer here. Now, when I published this, I got two emails from people. Neither of them had anything to do with the metronidazole uh, alcohol interaction. One was how dare you let that guy go to the wedding because he has C. diff. <laughs> Quarantine the man. You'd say that's bad medicine. The other one was better. It was, you are promoting alcohol. That is a bad thing. Anyway, I, nobody commented on the, the rest of the stuff, which is the whole interaction. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so let's talk about this. So the dogma is, for years, we advise patients to not use alcohol if they're taking metronidazole because of the fear for a disulfiram-like reaction. The patient will get, the person who takes metronidazole and then drinks alcohol get very sick, nausea, vomiting, flushing, cardiovascular collapse, and the worst case scenario, a lot of bad things that could happen. This is a standard wording that's still given on the pill bottles with metronidazole. There's a little martini glass with a big line through it. And so this is still out there and this is still sort of standard of care. So is there evidence for this? What meager evidence do we have? And where do we go from there? So where did this come from? Well, it always, these type of things frequently come from case reports. And there are a few case reports that reference textbooks to substantiate the interaction. So case reports had somebody drinking alcohol who was on metronidazole, got really sick, went back and said, hey, this has been proven. Now, where did this originally come from? Well, back in the 60s, there was some thought that maybe metronidazole could be just as good as disulfiram as something to help prevent people from drinking. That maybe it could curb the desire to drink. Nobody could really substantiate in any of those, in those articles and in, in what I could find in textbooks, except my guess is that not everybody feels great when they're taking metronidazole. And they're probably not going to want to drink just if they're not feeling great. But it wasn't based on an interaction. And we'll give you some data when it's actually been looked at. Does it cause a disulfiram reaction? So this is looking at more case reports uh, published between 1969 and 1982. None of these had measurements of increased acetaldehyde levels. None of them had any evidence to prove this. It was always this person was on metronidazole, they drank alcohol, they got sick. Therefore, I am just showing what's already known. Four of the eight cases were serious. There was one death. But in all the case reports, it was just referencing that this happens and this is why it is. There was no evidence to support that the, action, the interaction had actually occurred. And some of these patients were very, very, very sick medical patients who had quite a bit of alcohol, which certainly could have explained it. Now, how about in rat models? What happens if we give rats metronidazole and then we get them drunk? So what was found in, in the rat model is that you can get increased intracolonic, but not blood acetaldehyde. So they can get higher levels of acetaldehyde in the bowel, but not in the bloodstream. So they aren't absorbing whatever is occurring in the gut and they do not have decreased levels of alcohol dehydrogenase. That's one thing that's been proven too, is that metronidazole does not affect the enzymes in the blood and the liver that metabolize alcohol. What we don't know is any, if any of these rats got a disulfiram-like reaction, they didn't really complain too much about it. This is the only controlled study that there is about it. 12 healthy participants who all volunteered Okay, they got free metronidazole and free alcohol. Any guess where they found these folks? Yeah, medical school, good, that's right. I, you know, when I said that one time, my favorite answer was WSU. 
I like that better than medical school. Anyway, half of the study participants received metronidazole three times a day for five days, and that's important because in the previous study in the rat model, what they really found was that the metronidazole changed the bowel flora, not a big surprise. There are more Enterobacteraceae, which can actually affect metabolism and cause more, will, will actually cause more aldehyde, acid aldehyde. So it was important in this study that they gave them metronidazole for a while. They didn't just say, here's your dose of metronidazole, here's your alcohol, it must be an immediate interaction. So they did cover the issue of effect on bowel flora. So five days of metronidazole. Um, the other half received placebo. Now everybody got alcohol. So they all got 0.4 grams per kilogram with blood testing done every 20 minutes for the next four hours. Blood was tested for alcohol concentrations and acid aldehyde levels. They also measured temperature, pulse, blood pressure, looking to see if there were any changes in vital signs, and then they did questionnaires on how the, how the, how the participants felt. No changes in anything, and other than feeling that they'd had a little bit of alcohol, there were no symptoms at all of, of distress or feeling sick with the combination of the metronidazole and the alcohol. Okay, let's move on to another one. This is one that uh, I think is pretty timely as uh, flu shots have just become available in the last few weeks. 35-year-old woman with asthma presents for a follow-up visit in October. You recommend she receive influenza vaccine. She tells you she cannot take influenza vaccine because she is allergic to eggs. What do you recommend for her? Give her influenza vaccine, give her oseltamivir prescription and have her started if any flu-like symptoms appear, give her a nasal influenza vaccine, give her cell-based influenza vaccine. So which of these would you recommend for her? Okay, so 44%, go ahead and give her the influenza vaccine. I think that's probably the thing we have the best evidence for right now, so I agree with that. And then other folks are looking at other ways, or there, especially with a cell-based vaccine, is there any way we can get around the whole egg and egg protein? So let's go through what that concern is. What data do we have to make us comfortable giving influenza vaccine to patients who say they may have an egg allergy? So the worry, and this I call put this under the pathophysiology category, the idea that if you grow, if you grow the vaccine, you grow the virus in egg, that there might be minuscule amount of egg protein that might get transferred, and in somebody highly allergic, that might cause a severe life-threatening allergic reaction. So that's the pathophysiology concern. So what happens when people with egg allergy actually get influenza vaccine. This is a study of children with documented egg allergy confirmed with skin testing. Average age were three-year-olds, and then they got influenza vaccine. Included in the study were 27 patients who had actually anaphylaxis. These are the people we probably don't want to be studying. I mean, the people that were scared when you actually do the study, but 27 were part of this, and uh, nobody had a severe reaction. Nobody had anaphylaxis. Nobody had any, any lasting problem. There were a couple of episodes of abdominal pain, hard to know what that is, but nothing severe or serious in this group. How about all the data? This is looking at 28 studies, total of 4,315 patients with egg allergy who got influenza vaccine. 656 of them had a history of anaphylaxis with egg ingestion. None of these patients developed anaphylaxis or a serious reaction. So, Really what we have is what has happened to people who have actually gotten this and they have done remarkably well. They've done okay. What should we tell our patients? All patients with egg allergy of any severity should receive inactivated influenza vaccine using any age-approved method, so we don't have to avoid certain methods for them. And more recently, there has been a uh, recommendation that we don't have to do anything special after they get it. For the first few years that this recommendation came out, it was maybe it's best they get in an allergist's office or they're held for a prolonged waiting period, something bad may happen. But that was just leading to allergist's office clogged with people who got an influenza vaccine. And so now it's primary care folks can do this and you don't have to wait. So no special waiting periods after vaccination of egg allergic patients. What I don't fully understand is why in our clinics we still have sheets that talk about egg allergy. because. If we're going to 
give them the vaccine, why are we going to freak our patients out? Probably because if we don't do it, our patients will ask us and say, hey, I've had egg allergy, you're forgetting about this. Anyway, it's hard to change this, but we are seeing some real changes in this. And I think it's hugely important because we want everybody vaccinated and anything that blocks the ability to give uh, influenza vaccine isn't a good thing. A 60-year-old man is injured in a fall and breaks four ribs. He is in severe pain and is prescribed oxycodone and naproxen for pain. What treatment would you prescribe to help decrease problems with constipation? Docosate, docosate and polyethylene glycol, psyllium or polyethylene glycol? Okay, so 49% polyethylene glycol is very good. So most people are going psyllium polyethylene glycol. I think that's great. And what I wanted to do on this one is talk a little bit about the absolute absence of evidence of docosate or colase as an effective drug for constipation. It's still probably the most prescribed medication when somebody gets, is given narcotics or there may be a constipating situation coming up. So it's a stool softener, right? So the real, one of the questions we care about is does it soften stool? And that's a, makes, makes sense. So this is one to look at, this is a randomized controlled trial of docosate versus psyllium to look at stool weights, water content, things that would maybe make sense that would correlate with softening of the stool. 170 adult patients with chronic constipation got either 5.1 grams twice a day of psyllium or 100 milligrams twice a day of docosate. Compared with baseline, psyllium increased stool water content by 2.33% compared to 0.01% for docosate. Stool weight was increased in patients who were given psyllium compared to those with docosate. So the psyllium seemed to do something, the docosate didn't seem to do anything. Here's a study of patients who are opiate treated looking at constipation and in this study really didn't see that, that docosate added anything. They looked at 74 four patients randomized to get docosate plus senna or placebo plus senna, um, and there was no difference between groups. So adding the docosate was no better than adding placebo. When you look at uh, what is out there and conclusions of different folks who have looked at this, both have pretty much said the evidence doesn't really support the widespread use of docosate the way it's being used uh, today. This is a systemic review of usefulness of docosate in chronically ill patients, and the bottom line was um, in palliative care patients, it was inadequate experimental evidence for its use. Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies, available evidence suggests docosate is no more effective than placebo in the prevention or management of constipation. So widely used, not sure. Now, now one thing we could say, generally it's not going to cause a lot of trouble, right? I mean, it's, it's a relatively safe yet ineffective drug. Okay, a 69-year-old man is evaluated for fatigue. He undergoes a colonoscopy and found to have right-sided colon cancer. His hematocrit is 33 with an MCV of 72. His ferritin level is 3. What do you recommend to help with his iron deficiency? Iron sulfate 325 a day, iron sulfate 325 twice a day, iron sulfate 325 TID or iron gluconate 325 TID. Okay, so 39% want to give once daily iron. I think that's probably the right answer here. Um, I'm thrilled to see that very few people, less people want to give three times a day iron because that's generally just plain mean. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go through that. Um, many years ago when I was attending, I did something that probably wasn't right. Um, I, I was trying to make this point of not giving iron three times a day, so I asked everybody on my team to take iron three times a day because somebody had prescribed it, and we were going to see who would last the longest. And uh, so the, the residents, you, you know, they're very, very bright. So they, it was like half a day and they're done with it. And they're like, this is stupid. You know, I feel lousy. 
The intern made it two days, and the third year medical student made it four days, and that was it. It was like, <laughs> it was just not good. So, yeah, and they all agreed that they don't feel great on three times a day iron. Okay, this is a, a nice study in elderly patients, and the idea here, the, the generally, if you're iron deficient, you're going to absorb iron better. If you're iron replete, you're not going to absorb iron as well. Traditionally, we've given people 150 to 200 milligrams, if you give TID iron in most formulations, of iron a day. And this study was looking at, can we give people low doses of iron? And what happens if you give them low doses of iron? What happens to the markers you're looking for? What happens to their hemoglobin and hematocrits? And this was a good study because in older patients, because as we get older, we tend to worry more about our bowels, and we tend to have more constipation. So this is a group that can be really, really harmed by TID iron. So 90 hospitalized elderly patients older than 80 with iron deficiency anemia randomized to get elemental iron, 15 milligrams or 50 milligrams given as liquid ferrous gluconate, or 150 milligrams of elemental iron given as ferrous calcium citrate for 60 days, and they looked at what happened to them. No difference in rise in hemoglobin or ferritin levels between groups. So the 15 a day was as good as giving them the high dose TID iron. And it is not surprising that the more iron they got, the more discomfort they had. There was a significant uh, difference in abdominal discomfort in patients who got the 15 milligrams compared to 60% of those who got the 50 and 70% of those who got the 150. Now, does it work in people that aren't other groups. This is an elderly population, and here is a study that just looked at giving people once a day iron after they donated blood, when they would get some iron deficiency by donating blood re frequently, can you get their hematocrits and everything up, up to snuff with once daily iron. 215 blood donors to get uh, low dose iron or no treatment, and uh, those who got the iron recovered more quickly towards pre-donation pre hematocrit, 80 uh, percent recovery 32 days versus 92% to get to that 80% uh, recovery in those who didn't get iron. So the bottom line was once daily iron seemed to work and speed up recovery. So the low dose iron seems to work in more than, than an elderly population. Okay, this happens all the time in our clinics. A 55 year old patient of yours requests new prescriptions from you at a routine appointment. She will be traveling internationally next month and wants to replace her emergency medication kit as the medications in it, ciprofloxacin, loperamide, and oxycodone have all expired. What do you do? Replace the prescription for ciprofloxacin, replace all three medications, or tell the patient that all the meds should still be fine. Good, 70% are saying, don't worry about the expiration date. And I think that's the right answer. And we'll go through some data on effectiveness of expired meds. And especially, I think it's especially important in infrequently used meds. For most prescription meds people, people are on regularly, they're taking them regularly. They're not going to sit around for five years, and then the question will come up. So what is an expiration date? Expiration date is a required date that the manufacturer has to guarantee 90% potency of the drug. It doesn't mean that after that date, these drugs necessarily are not effective. It's they've proven efficacy out to that point. There really is zero motivation for the pharmaceutical industry to, to extend expiration dates, right? Because if, if you have a group of folks who, who will never take anything past an expiration date because they will never violate any rule, they're going to throw those away and ask for more drugs and more money comes in. So this is an area that there hasn't been a ton of research on, except for one group. Um, the military has large stockpiles of medications, and they often sit for a long time. And it makes total sense if you can extend those expiration dates because you've got a lot of money uh, invested in these meds that sit there and aren't needed. This is a, the shelf life extension program is something that has been looked at to try to help with extending the shelf life, especially for medications in the military. 122 drugs were studied representing over 3,000 lots of drugs. 88% of these had over 90% potency one year past expiration date with an average extension of five years past the expiration date. Just to give you a couple of examples, ciprofloxacin, the average was 55 months past the expiration date. 
doxycycline 50 months past the expiration date. So both of these are things that people might have in their cabinet, doxycycline for malaria prophylaxis. They may have it sitting around for a while. Ciprofloxacin, they may have it for traveler's diarrhea. So these are things that may be fine. I thought this was a fascinating study. Somebody stumbled on drugs that have been like mothballed for an average between 28 and 40 years. And they looked, well, okay, let's look like really old drugs, you know, apothecary style. Sealed drugs from a retail pharmacy that were 28 to 40 years past expiration date. 12 of the 14 compounds tested were in concentrations over 90% of the labeled amount. Some of these examples, codeine, hydrocodone, acetaminophen. The one exception was aspirin. Aspirin broke down and aspirin broke down to almost non-detectable amounts. So aspirin may be an exception of something that doesn't appear to be real stable for long periods of time. Now, 28 years is a really long period of time. Now, the question that comes up all the time is, okay, that's fine, but if the worst thing that could happen is poor efficacy, we can deal with that. You know, if you take, a, if you take something that's supposed to help slow down your diarrhea and it doesn't work, then you'll go out and buy it. But what about toxicity? Is there a danger to taking expired medications? And really the only thing that's ever been reported was a tetracycline preparation that's no longer on the market causing Fanconi syndrome. And there, I found a total of six case reports, four in one, two in the other, the last from 1982. This preparation's off the market. So really no direct breakdown drug toxicities have been reported. So I think we can reassure our patients that the worst case scenario won't work probably is going to work, and especially for these meds that, that are just stockpiled for occasional trips, they probably don't need to be getting them refilled all the time whenever they hit expiration date. This one, I, I'm, I'm really excited to find some data on this. I was lecturing about 10 years ago, and I often ask people, what are your favorite myths? I want to have some more things to look into. And somebody brought this up, and 10 years ago when I looked into it, there was no data, and now there is. 58-year-old woman with a history of right breast cancer, status post-lumpectomy and lymph node dissection five years ago presents her follow-up. Labs are ordered and left arm blood draws attempted times three without success. What do you recommend? Left leg blood draw, left neck blood draw, left radial artery draw, or right arm blood draw? Yeah, let's not do anything crazy here. Let's not stick her radial artery. Let's not draw from her foot. That's just plain strange. She's got a right arm, and we can do that. Now, the patient is going to fight you on this because they've been told from the day that they had their cancer surgery, breast cancer surgeries, don't let anybody touch the arm on that side. No blood pressures, no immunizations, no blood draws, no handshakes. Just, you know, keep that arm away from people because if you do things with that arm, you are at higher risk for lymphedema. That's what, the, that's what the dogma has been. And that's a pathophysiology one. Okay, That's the idea that if you use something that might have less lymph drainage, you may swell, you're going to get more trouble. If you stick needles in it, your risk for cellulitis may go up, and that's going to be bad for it. That's the whole thinking behind it. Blood pressure cuff is going to cause some maybe some increased hydrostatic pressure for a little while, and then you won't be able to clear that edema. That's the whole idea behind that. And what do we have as far as data? So classic teaching is just don't let anybody touch that arm. So this is a, a study that looks at uh, individuals undergoing treatment for breast cancer between 2005 and 2014. They were prospectively screened for lymphedema. 3,000 measurements, no association with volume change or weight-adjusted change, increase undergoing one or more blood draws, injections, or blood pressure measurements. So they looked at, is there a difference in amount of edema in people who were a little looser about using that arm versus people that really followed it incredibly strictly? And they did careful measurements, and they found no difference whatsoever. What were the non-precautionary behaviors that their patients had done? Well, 20, 251 of, of them had had one or more blood draws on the ipsilateral side. 63 had had one or more injections, immunizations there. And 482 of them had had one or more blood pressure measurements. So 
doesn't appear that this is, this is something we don't have a lot of data for, but it just always smelled a bit like a myth. At least we have a little bit of data now. I had an opportunity to talk to a patient yesterday about this, and, uh, and you know, their first thought was, are you kidding? I'm not going to give up. You know, I'm not going to be doing it. And then they thought a little bit, and they thought, you know, it always takes some five sticks on my left arm to draw my blood and look at this great vein on my right side. I think I'll probably, I'll probably take my chances and let them draw the blood from the right side. Okay, we're going to move on into a few of my all-time favorite myths. So forgive me if you've heard these before, but, uh, but I, I, these ones seem to endure. 82-year-old woman is evaluated for fatigue. Lab eval reveals hemoglobin of 8 with an MCV of 114. B12 level is 90 with normal B12 levels over 200. Folate level is normal. Urine methylmalonic acid level is high. What would you recommend for this patient? A Schilling test? oral B12, 1,000 micrograms a day, blood transfusion, then IM B12 monthly, or an IM B12 load, then monthly B12 injections. Okay, good. Half of you want to give oral B12. I think that's a great thing to do here. 43% wanted to go ahead and give IMB12, which would absolutely work. 7% um, want to get a shillings test. I wouldn't do that just because you'll have to make 50 calls and people are going <laughs> to ask you what it is. Um, so here, here's just a, a blurb from Harrison's from 1994. This has always been the conventional wisdom. Since the detect is one of the absorption, replacement should be administered parenterally, specifically in the form of intramuscular cyanocobalamin. If intramuscular administration is contraindicated or refused, cobalamin deficiency can be managed by oral replacement from 300 to 1,000 a day, which is an expensive <laughs> mode of treatment which requires close medical supervision to avoid relapse. So clearly they're not weighing on the side of do that. It's, Give it IM, and if they refuse it, yeah, you can kind of do some oral replacement. Let's look at the data. So early studies back in the 50s were uniformly failures. And the reason for that was they used tiny doses of B12, and they were really stuck on giving intrinsic factor as well. The idea that you really need intrinsic factor to absorb vitamin B12, so we'll give some intrinsic factor, a little bit of B12, and see if that works. Well, it didn't work. Antibodies formed in the intrinsic factor. It just wasn't an effective thing. So after several studies that were failures, it pretty much was true that you had to give IMB12, and that was accepted. Studies continued for a number of years, and this is a 1968 study uh, looking at 64 patients with established B12 deficiency from three Swedish medical centers, lots of B12 deficiency in Scandinavia. Um, they got 500 or 1,000 micrograms a day of B12 all 64 normalized B12 levels, all of them normalized their hemoglobin somatocrit, and all of them felt great. Nobody got neurologic abnormalities. Everybody did well. So 64 of 64 who got oral B12 did well. And this study just got lost in the literature. It didn't change practice. It didn't lead to follow-up studies. It was just kind of, yeah, this is a cool thing. And it really didn't get picked up. In 1998, another study was published uh, looking at 38 newly diagnosed people with B12 deficiency. And one important thing, all these, these people all had pernicious anemia. Okay, so they weren't B12 deficiency because three quarters of their GI tract was removed. These are individuals who had pernicious anemia. They were randomly design, assigned to get IM B12, a thousand, uh, one milligram nine times in three months, or two milligrams of oral B12. This was the 90s. Everything has to be bigger and better. A thousand was fine. Let's just give everybody 2,000. B12 levels and methylmalonic acid levels were measured. In the IM B12 group, they rose to a normal level from 95 to 325. In the oral B12 group, they went remarkably high from 93 to over 1,000 with the oral B12. So their conclusion was oral B12 works. Why does it work? Well, it works because you can absorb B12 in two ways. One is a very efficient way with intrinsic factor, which really helps us absorb our B12 in a very effective way. And then it also can be absorbed through mass action. If you give enough of it, you can get a little bit of it across. And if you're giving 1,000 micrograms, when a normal daily intake is, is dramatically less than that, 
you can get enough across, and that's why this works. If you use a dose of 1,000 a day, that gives you a nice safety zone. 2,000, if you want to follow the more recent study, that's fine, but 1,000 should work. It is, remember Harrison said it's expensive, so it's about $5 a month, so that's not particularly expensive. We are all very comfortable following B12 levels, CBCs, whatever you want to follow, not really difficult to follow. We do that certainly with our patients who are on thyroid hormone and do that successfully. A 30-year-old woman cuts her finger on a glass jar. She goes to the ED and needs to have sutures on her ring, right ring finger. What would you recommend for anesthesia to prepare her for repair? So we got somebody who cuts her finger and you're going to suture it up. What do you want to number up with? Bupivacaine, 1% lidocaine, 1% lidocaine with epinephrine, 2% lidocaine or saline. So which of these would you like to use? Okay, so 53%, 1% lidocaine, 29% are going to give lidocaine with epi, and then a little bit higher doses of lidocaine, 4% want to try saline. So, so this is pretty, you know, this is kind of what we do. You know, we give a lot of lidocaine for this, which works great. And the real question is, what is the benefit if you give epi, and are you, are you insane if you give epinephrine? I mean, as you know, if you do it, I promise you, if you do it enough, somebody sees you do it, they're going to tell you you're crazy. And what is the data? Because we've always been taught you should never give epinephrine to end arterial fields, that, that the risk of gangrene, the risk of ischemia is too great and we just don't do this. Fingers and toes, this is in many different emergency medicine textbooks over the years. And so what should we do about this? This is a, a nice study that was actually a randomized controlled study, 60 digital block procedures, 31 randomized to lidocaine with epi, 29 to lidocaine alone. In the lidocaine with epi group, one person needed additional anesthesia, five in the lidocaine alone needed additional anesthesia, and it makes some sense. With epinephrine, there's not as much breakdown of lidocaine. It, it works a little bit better. As far as bleeding, of course, the giving the epinephrine worked a bit better. Digital tourniquet was needed in nine of 31 who got lidocaine with epi, and 20 of 29 in the lidocaine alone group. Two people had complications, and those were both in the lidocaine group not in epi. Tiny little study. It was done nicely. I don't know if that changes practice, but practice has already been changed. I like this study. This is what do hand surgeons do? They kind of do this all day. You know, they're the professionals at this. Do they use lidocaine with epi? And the answer is a resounding, of course they do. This is a study looking at prospectively the incidence of digital infarction and phentolamine rescue in a large series of patients who received epinephrine in their fingers and hands. From 2002 to 2004, nine hand surgeons prospectively recorded each consecutive case of hand and finger epinephrine injection. 3,100 consecutive cases of elective injection of low-dose epinephrine in the hands and fingers. No cases of digital tissue loss, never needed phentolamine. So this is a standard of care for many hand surgeons, and they aren't running any problem with it. 29-year-old woman presents her evaluation. She reports she has had frequent headaches over the last 12 months that include pressure pain on her forehead, under her eyes, and over her cheeks. She usually has nasal, nasal congestion as well. She has not had any fevers or purulent nasal discharge. What do you think she has? So 29-year-old headaches over the last 12 months, pressure pain, forehead, under her eyes, and cheeks, kind of come and go for a few days at a time. No fevers, no purulent nasal discharge. What does she have? Cluster headaches, migraine headaches, sinus headaches, or tension headaches? So 41% chose sinus headaches, 16% migraines, some chose clusters. So this is a migraine variant, and we'll go through some of the data. And most of the patients out there with this will tell you they have sinus headaches, and some of them will wrestle you if you try to tell them otherwise. So this is a, a nicely done large study, almost 3,000 patients screened who reported at least six headaches during the previous six months, self-diagnosed or physician-diagnosed as sinus headaches. 88% of these patients met International Headache Society criteria for migraine. Um, 
The most common symptoms were sinus pressure, sinus pain, and nasal congestion. So a lot of things that would make us think about that this would be a sinus-related thing, but what it is is a migraine that's involving nerves that involve the sinuses. Another study that looked at a smaller group of patients, 100 patients who thought they had sinus headaches, all got a detailed history and physical exam and International Headache Society criteria. Final diagnosis, again, in the high 80s for migraine. Migraine with or without order, 52%. Probable migraine, 23%. Chronic migraine with medication overuse at 11%. 76% of the migraine patients reported pain in the distribution of the second division of the trigeminal nerve. And interestingly, 62% have bilateral forehead pain and maxillary pain. So we're always taught unilateral, think migraine. In this variant, it can be bilateral. So my favorite study is this treatment study. So that's nice to look at International Headache Study criteria. But what happens if you treat these patients who have these symptoms? This was a study to look at response rate to triptans and other migraine-directed medications in alleviating sinus headache in patients who had endoscopy and CT-negative sinus exams. So the way they recruited, they put up posters in, in physician offices, in student health services, other places are, do you think you have sinus headaches? We have a new treatment. So they got people who believed they had sinus headaches. The people who were going to be enrolled in the study then were all received a CT scan of their sinuses and then endoscopy to look at their sinuses. There was a significant dropout rate in the study. And all the people who dropped out dropped out specifically because they were told they didn't have sinus disease. At which point, it, they were angry and started wrestling with the you know, investigators and like, I'm not coming back. I'm going to find a real doctor who knows these things. So the dropout rate was before getting any medications. It was, if you don't say I have sinus disease, I'm going to keep looking until I find somebody who knows more. So it was an interesting dropout in the study. So a total of 54 patients enrolled. 38 of them were brave enough to actually take medications and treatment for this. 31 or 82% responded with triptan use. Uh, a few more, uh, three of them, or four more got uh, nasal ergotamines that seemed to help them. So they had 92% response to migraine-directed therapy. So I, I think this is an interesting migraine variant. It's things we see a lot in primary care, our patient who gets two or three sinus headaches. And one of the great things about diagnosing this is this is another opportunity to not give people antibiotics. Most of these patients come in and say, I just need antibiotics. I got that sinus thing again. When you diagnose migraine, antibiotics aren't good for migraine, so treat them for migraine. Okay, I'm going to finish up with a couple of retired myths, and I think these are things that were really hot in the early 90s as far as, and I think we've really moved medical practice away from these, so I think we do make, make headway here over time. A 46-year-old man presents to the ED with severe abdominal pain. He states onset of pain was two hours ago, began suddenly in the epigastric area. He has not used any alcohol in the last two weeks, but has been on paroxicam for osteoarthritis for the past six months. On your exam, he has a rigid abdomen without rebound tenderness. He is in severe pain. You call the surgeon, and she'll be available to examine the patient in 20 minutes. So we got a 46-year-old with severe abdominal pain, start two hours ago, horrendous pain, he's got a rigid abdomen, um, just writhing in pain, you call the surgeon and she'll be there in 20 minutes. What do you do? Give the patient IV morphine, give the patient IM Tordal, give the patient IV Demerol, no narcotics, wait for surgical evaluation. Good, 83% are gonna treat this person's pain. And for many years, we were taught that you're gonna get strangled by the surgeon if you give narcotic pain medication because it would botch the exam, they couldn't make a good diagnosis, it's gonna to lead to an incomplete exam. And fortunately, this was looked at. This is a conventional wisdom from, from 1979, Cope's early diagnosis of acute abdomen. If morphine be given, it is possible for a patient to die happy in the belief that he is on the road to recovery, and in some cases, medical attendant may for a time be induced to share the same elusive hope. <laughs> this is a study, 1996, a prospective double-blind placebo-controlled administration of morphine or saline in 71 patients with acute abdomen. I believe this was done at Madigan. 
No difference between groups with accuracy of provisional or differential diagnosis with final diagnosis, three diagnostic, diagnostic management errors in each group, and not surprisingly, those who got the morphine had superior pain control. Another study, 100 consecutive patients with severe abdominal pain admitted to a surgical service, all patients evaluated by the admitting officer, then half received saline IM, half received narcotics IM. Surgeons felt e equally confident in diagnostic and management decisions in both groups. Surgeons' decision to operate or observe was incorrect in two patients in the narcotic group and nine in the saline group. So with this type of data, I think we've moved towards treating acute pain in our emergency settings and not worrying about it it hiding, hiding the diagnosis. I also think, to some degree, this also is in the era where much more imaging started to occur, and you know, you don't even get a chance to give them morphine because they're in a CT scanner for the whole time. So, but uh, but we have evolved here, and it, and I think that's a good thing. Here's our last case: 33-year-old uh, man comes to the office with uh, complaints of right eye pain. He was scratched in the eye playing basketball last night. On physical exam, the sclera appears injected. Fluorescein exam reveals a corneal abrasion. What therapy do you recommend? Eye patch, right eye for 48 hours. Eye patch, right eye for 72 hours. Eye patch, amidriatic drops, topical antibiotics. Eye patch, amidriatic drops, or amidriatic drops and topical antibiotic. Yeah, so we don't eye patch as much. We don't do it much anymore because there really never was any data that putting an eye patch on anybody he helped them heal quicker. So I think the right answer here is just don't eye patch. And whether you give them meteorotic drops or topical antibiotic or just say it's going to get better, we don't need to put an eye patch on. The idea on the eye patch is it would either, protect the cornea, it would do something positive, but when been studied, that didn't appear to be the case. 44 patients in randomized control trial, traumatic corneal abrasions less than 24 hours to iPad and homotropine and chloramphenicol drops or homotropine chloramphenicol drops. Time to heal was two days in the iPad group, 1.55 days in the no iPad group. Pain scores were better in the no iPad group. Another study, small study, 30 patients, corneal abrasions, randomized chloramphenicol drops with or without iPad and results were were comfort and healing. Comfort were 14 in the iPad group, 14 in the no iPad group. Painless, four in the iPad group, 10 in the no iPad group. Painful, 12 in the iPad group. So the iPad didn't seem to be helpful. There are a lot of theories on this. I, my favorite theory was it changed the oxygen over right over the eye. I don't know how that happens. But uh, not really fully worked out, but iPads probably don't work. Now, the ophthalmologist then went to using contact lenses, putting contact lenses on these, and that was the standard of care through the end of the 90s to the early 2000s, and more recently, there doesn't appear to be a benefit with contact lens. So really, let it heal is probably the right thing here. So no benefit to eye patching and reducing pain, and there may be slightly improved healing without eye patch. That's the last myth I have. I'm happy to handle any questions you have. I'd love it if you have things that you think are myths that you'd like to share. I always look for new ideas on, on myths to go chasing after. Thank you so much for your attention.